Hello, everybody. Uh, while we're waiting to get everybody on the Zoom link, um, you will see here that we are preparing a very, uh, I would say, cool session of the Fong uh, lecture series. We will start this season with Erin today, but we have more coming. The second one that will be on the 24th of April, we will have here Barnabas Daru. Remember that the Fong lectures are happening almost uh, all Wednesday, the last Wednesdays of every month. The time is a little bit, um, it depends where our Fong lecture uh, presenter is based, but normally it's uh, 5 p.m. Uh, and then remember as well that we have our uh, next biannual conference that will be in January 2026 and it will happen in Orpus. So, um, and just as a reminder as well, after Erin's uh, talk, we will have time for questions um, and answers. And as always, please use the questions and answers. Um, if you wanna write your question, use that one as well. Sometimes we, we might forget to monitor the chat. So please focus on the questions and answer box out. Please raise your hand and we will give you entrance. So let's wait uh, one minute or more. So if you are ready, Erin, yes. So let me, it's my great pleasure introducing Professor Erin So from the University of Oxford. Uh, she's a paleo biologist and her main focus is studying the interactions between life and environment over geological uh, time scales. One of the main focus of her research group as well is um, working around the concept of conservation paleobiology which applies the time information to current problem species conservation. So as well, part of her work is based on understanding the what makes a species prone to extinctions as well latitudinal gradients. So Erin, all for you. I will stop sharing the screen and then you will be able to start sharing. Perfect, thank you so much for that introduction and thanks so much for inviting me to speak. Um, I will. Share my screen with you. Can you see the presentation? Uh, yeah. Put it into presentation mode. Hmm. Let's see. Stop sharing. Tape. Uh, let's see. Share. How about that? Does that work? Perfect. Fantastic. All right. Great. All for you. Sorry. Sorry about the issues. Um, so yeah, thanks again for inviting me uh, to speak here. I'm um, I'm really honored and very excited to be speaking to you guys today. So um, as all of you will be aware, um, the latitudinal diversity gradient is one of the largest scale and longest known um, patterns in ecology. Uh, and it describes this increasing pattern in the number of species observed from the poles to the equator. Uh, and I really became interested in LDGs like a lot of people um, because they can potentially tell us about the drivers of diversification on long time scales and what structures species distributions speciation and extinction over time. Uh, 
Uh, so today I'm going to uh, talk to you about the emergence of the latitudinal diversity gradient and potential drivers of latitudinal diversity gradients with a focus on planktonic foraminifera. Let's see, uh, there we go. So the latitudinal diversity gradient was first recognized over 200 years ago by Alexander von Humboldt when he described the increase in the variety of structure, grace of form, and mixture of colors towards the equator. Um, and ever since Alexander von Humboldt first described the diversity gradient, there have been over 100 hypotheses proposed to explain why we see higher diversity uh, in the tropics. I do not know why it's not advancing very easily. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that, uh, that is exceptional about the diversity gradient is the pervasiveness of the patterns. So we find the diversity gradient on land, like you see here for vertebrate diversity. We find the diversity gradient um, in the sea, like you see here for copepod diversity. Um, and we find diversity gradients, not only in animals, uh, but also in plants, like you see here uh, for vascular plants. Diversity gradients um, have been studied really intensively in both the marine and the terrestrial realm um, in the present day, and work has been done to quantify diversity gradients at specific times in Earth history as well, so in the geological past. But despite all of this intensive work and all of this interest in latitudinal diversity gradients, there's still a lot of debate about the causes of LDGs. And ultimately, um, when thinking about causal mechanisms for latitudinal diversity gradients, they boil down to, and they must invoke differences in regional rates of speciation, extinction, local extirpation, and then the movement of species into or out of regions. And these four uh, processes are really the only way to generate differential numbers of species across geographic space. These processes uh, themselves are thought to be controlled by a suite of abiotic and biotic factors. So things like spatiotemporal climate change, um, species interactions and available area and resources. But the problem with identifying causal factors um, is that many of the factors thought to affect rates of speciation and extinction are collinear with latitude today, which you can see here for temperature and precipitation. And this makes it difficult to disentangle which factors are actually driving higher diversity at low latitudes today. Um, the fossil record though, can actually uh, provide us with times when the relationship between latitude and the hypothesized drivers of things like speciation and extinction, so temperature and precipitation um, being two examples, were actually different from today. So times when they were not collinear with latitude. So by looking to the past, we can potentially gain insight into which of the factors may be key to generating latitudinal diversity gradients. Not only that, um, but the fossil record can also provide us with insight on whether a modern style diversity gradient has been present consistently over long time scales. And um, if it hasn't been, what this tells us about the potential drivers of the diversity gradient. So, Although the fossil record has a lot of potential, in, in my opinion, as a paleontologist, um, it hasn't really been possible to ask this type of question previously, at least at a fairly high spatial and temporal resolution, because of the relatively coarse resolution of most fossil data, of course, both spatially um, as well as temporally. But uh, what is exciting is that um, recent work in my lab generated a new data set at pretty high spatial and temporal resolution for planktonic foraminifera. And we called this data set Triton. Um, and planktonic foraminifera, for those of you who are not familiar, are single-celled protists. So they build a hard calcite shell called a test, and they can live at a variety of depths um, across the world's oceans. And they've been present uh, very uh, in, in abundance um, over the Cenozoic, so over the last 65 million years. Um, the new database that we created, Triton, is now the largest database for any fossil clade to date. So it contains more than 500,000 records over the last 65 million years, so over the Cenozoic. And what we did in Triton was we ensured comparability among all of the data sources that we used to compile Triton. So we cleaned all of the occurrence records using a unified set of taxonomic concepts. 
we converted all of the ages to the same updated time scale, and then we rotated all of the occurrences using the same paleo coordinate rotation model to obtain latitude and longitude coordinates in deep time. So uh, using Triton, um, we wanted to construct latitudinal diversity gradients at multiple intervals over the Cenozoic. And we wanted to basically ask, how has the shape of the LDG for planktonic foraminifera changed over time? Or has it even changed over time? Um, and I'm going to focus here on results that where we constructed latitudinal diversity gradients at 2.5 million year intervals over the last 40 million years. But the results were insensitive to spatial and temporal binning schemes. So we tried a lot of different temporal and spatial binning schemes uh, with similar results. For each of the time slices that we were focusing on within that 40 million year interval, we um, constructed latitudinal diversity gradients using five different methods um, or approaches, which you can see here. And this includes subsampling to account for spatial and temporal heterogeneity in the amount of fossil data that we have across space and through time. So we wanted to keep uh, sampling effort constant through time. Um, what's really uh, great, uh, <laughs> was great news for us, is that actually the five different approaches produce congruent patterns. So um, again, I'm going to focus here on diversity gradients um, that were constructed using the 75th percentile of point level richness estimates within these 2.5 million year time bins. Um, and Using uh, a percentile approach is appropriate to define latitudinal diversity gradients because it's really the upper tail of diversity distributions that generate the shape of latitudinal diversity gradients. And that's true even today. Um, so even at low latitudes today, uh, you can have regions that are very depauperate or, or poor in species. Um, and you can see that here, for example, for modern marine fishes. So at, at low latitudes, you have areas that are quite uh, species poor. All right, so what did um, this new data compilation and approach tell us about diversity gradients uh, through time? Well, all of the different approaches that we used, including those different spatial and temporal binning schemes, um, showed us significant changes in the spatial distribution of planktonic foraminifera over the last 40 million years. Uh, we found that a modern style latitudinal diversity gradient began to emerge only gradually, um, beginning about 34 million years ago, but it remained fairly shallow until around 15 to 10 million years ago. So the colors indicate ages, with red um, being the oldest and then blue uh, the youngest. This deepening of the diversity gradient towards the present day can be illustrated graphically by measuring the actual slope uh, through time and showing actual changes in the slope through time. Um, and this is what I'm showing you here. So we estimated the slope using a linear model of richness as a function of absolute latitude. Um, and what's hopefully clear is that we're able to show for the first time that there is a steepening of the diversity gradient or that actual slope towards the present day from virtually no gradient about 40 million years ago. And nobody's actually been able to look um, at this with this granularity at how changes in the LDG have, um, have a, or, or what changes rather have occurred over time. The fact uh, that the diversity gradient emerged only gradually over the last 40 million years means that we could actually try to identify potential drivers of the changes that we observed in the LDG. And to investigate potential drivers, we use two different modeling approaches. So in the first uh, modeling approach, we uh, modeled the relationship between um, richness and uh, various environmental factors using spatial autoregressive models, so within time bins. And then in the second um, approach, we modeled the relationship between change in richness and then change in those environmental variables at given locations on Earth over set intervals of time. So we actually used a, a variety of intervals of time. So 2.5 million year intervals, 5 million year intervals, 7.5 million year intervals, 10 million year intervals, and then 12.5 million year intervals of time. And the environmental variables that we focused on um, were specifically mean annual sea surface salinity, mean annual thermocline extent, 
mean annual mixed layer depth, and then a measure of temperature. And we actually considered two different measures of temperature. We considered both mean annual sea surface temperature and then a measure of variability of temperature within the water column at specific points on Earth. The uh, climate data that we used um, for these analyses came from the HAD-CM3L uh, Coupled Atmosphere Ocean Generalized Circulation Model, and this was done in collaboration with Paul Valdez, Dan Lunt, and Alex Farnsworth at the University of Bristol. And we needed to use climate data rather than, say, proxy data um, because this modeling framework required spatially and temporally explicit estimates of climate for each estimate of richness, which, of course, is not available with proxy data over 40 million years. So results um, from both of these modeling uh, exercises, so the models that were built uh, across space within time bins, but then also through time, looking at changes in richness and changes in climate, suggest that temperature is the only variable that exhibits a consistent um, and strong positive relationship with richness over time. And this is what I'm showing you here, for the models built within time intervals, um, so those spatial autoregressive models. And this relationship of richness with temperature persisted for at least the last 15 million years um, and perhaps longer, but the confidence intervals overlap zero further back in time. So results from both uh, modeling approaches agree that temperature and temperature variability within the water column vertically correlate positively with richness in uh, both types of models. And this is, um, it, it, I think is quite interesting uh, because it means that the changes we see in the diversity gradient for planktonic foraminifera mirror the changes that we see in the steepness of the latitudinal temperature gradient over time. Um, so uh, we see initial um, formation of the diversity gradient in planktonic foraminifera beginning around 34 million years ago and this is actually coincident with the transition from warm house to cool house conditions. And then we see significant steepening of the diversity gradient coincident with the steepening of the latitudinal temperature gradient beginning about 15 million years ago. Um, and what I think is important is that the steepening of the latitudinal temperature gradient is actually associated with an increase in vertical temperature structure at low latitudes. So essentially colder bottom waters are being brought down from higher latitudes to the tropics, and that's increasing uh, the variability in temperature that exists at low latitudes um, or, or in the tropics. And this might mean uh, that the modern day LDG for planktonic foraminifera was caused, at least in part, by enhanced thermal niche partitioning at low latitudes. Um, and this might have increased speciation at low latitudes, and or cause the collapse of communities at higher latitudes as warmer water niches were removed. So um, if this were true, we would expect changes in planktonic foraminifera um, and how they partition by depth within the water column over time and across space. Um, and we can actually quantify this, again, because of the fossil record for planktonic foraminifera is so good um, using the new Triton database. So we can actually look at uh, changes in how planktonic foraminifera communities partition across steps within the water column uh, through time. And we can do this using a metric of evenness. Uh, so this examines how species numbers uh, vary across habitats, in this case, across depth habitats within the water column. Low evenness, as most of you will know, um, indicate more species are present at one water depth over another water depth. And for uh, each of the time intervals that we were looking at, we examined how species were distributed across three depths. So the mixed layer, the thermocline, and the subthermocline. And we did this also across latitudes. And our idea was to test if assemblages exhibited more evenness of depths across latitudes when the gradient was shallower millions of years ago. So what we found um, was that assemblages did indeed exhibit more evenness of depths across latitudes when the gradient was shallower millions of years ago. And this implies that warmer waters at high latitudes supported a broader range of vertical temperature habitats deeper in time, where you had more species across these uh, vertical temperature habitats. 
but that these disappeared um, as uh, assemblages collapsed with um, climate cooling. So if warmer um, waters at high latitudes supported a broader range of vertical temperature habitats deeper in time, we would expect higher extirpation or extinction at, at high latitudes, and then potentially higher rates of speciation at low latitudes as more niches are created because of that thermal re restructuring as climate cools and those colder bottom waters are being brought down to the tropics. And so what we wanted to do was quantify rates of speciation, extinction, extirpation, and dispersal in low and high latitude regions, which we've defined as within or exclusive of 30 degrees latitude. And both um, elevated extinction and extirpation at high latitudes, and of course, elevated speciation at low latitudes could contribute to the formation of the diversity gradient over time in planktonic foraminifera. So we wanted to look at which of these processes uh, was actually driving the pattern. And what we found um, is that speciation was the primary contributor to the emergence of the latitudinal diversity gradient in planktonic foraminifera over the last 40 million years. So low latitude speciation began to exceed high latitude speciation after about 30 million years or so in a consistent fashion. Um, in addition to this low latitude speciation, Local extirpation at high latitudes also contributed to a modern style LDG for planktonic foraminifera, but it had a smaller effect size than speciation. Um, extinction uh, did not contribute to the emergence of a latitudinal diversity gradient because extinction was actually higher at low latitudes beginning about 20 million years ago. So the reverse pattern of what you would expect. Um, and similarly, dispersal from uh, high to low latitudes did not contribute to the emergence of a diversity gradient um, because dispersal was reversed. So it occurred predominantly from uh, low to high latitudes, which again is the opposite pattern of what you would expect um, if it contributed to the emergence of the LDG. So taken together, uh, these results suggest that the modern day uh, diversity gradient for planktonic foraminifera is controlled primarily by speciation at low latitudes and then secondarily by local extirpation at high latitudes over the last 30 to 15 million years. Um, and we therefore suggest uh, um, that the modern day diversity gradient for planktonic foraminifera may have formed due to high latitude cooling. Um, and this high latitude cooling brought colder bottom waters to the tropics, which increased latitudinal temperature gradients, but more importantly, increased vertical temperature gradients at low latitudes. And these vertical uh, temperature structure actually uh, at low latitudes, so near the equator, may have uh, led to increased niche partitioning, providing more opportunities for speciation. And consistent with this, we found higher rates of low latitude speciation beginning about 30 million years ago. And what I think is really interesting is that the tropics today are actually richer, uh, so have house more species than the tropics 40 to 20 million years ago. Um, again, maybe this is due to a stronger vertical temperature structure that was weak to absent during warmer time periods. So we have shown, uh, I think for one of the first times that a modern style diversity gradient has only been present around the last 15 million years for a particular group of organisms, in this case, planktonic foraminifera. And if these conclusions hold to further uh, scrutiny, then low latitude speciation was the primary contributor to the emergence of a modern style LDG in planktonic foraminifera. And uh, what is interesting is that some of my past work on um, terrestrial latitudinal diversity gradients also has suggested that low latitude speciation has contributed to diversity gradients on land. And this past work on terrestrial latitudinal diversity gradients, I uh, relied on, on simulation frameworks rather than empirical data uh, with um, a, a team of researchers um, from the University of Kansas, as well as um, China. And specifically, what we were doing is using eco-evolutionary simulation models to test whether climate change, so both across space, but also through time, 
could generate uh, latitudinal diversity gradients from no starting biodiversity pattern. And our hypothesis was that the dynamics of climate change across space and through time could actually uh, uh, contribute to higher rates of range fragmentation at low latitudes. And this range fragmentation at low latitudes would then eventually result in speciation, which would pile up species in the tropics, therefore um, allowing for a diversity gradient to form. Um, so in other words, uh, just to make sure that um, everyone can get on the same page, the spatiotemporal dynamics of climate uh, change cause more range fragmentation at low latitudes because potentially you have regions of unsuitability uh, that are forming um, and maintaining themselves, and that this causes higher rates of allopatric speciation at low latitudes compared to high latitudes, and this helps to contribute to the latitudinal diversity gradient. And what we wanted to know using this eco-evolutionary simulation framework was whether we could replicate latitudinal diversity gradients using only a few species characteristics interacting with a dynamic climate over the last 120,000 years from no, again, starting diversity gradient. So um, what we did was we created virtual species that could move across the simulation landscape, and this was divided into grid cells. Um, these species could move based on a dispersal ability that they were assigned, and they could only occupy grid cells that were climatically suitable for them. These climatic tolerances were also assigned, but the climatic conditions of each cell would change through time depending on how the climate changed. Uh, and this, of course, is going to um, affect whether those cells remain suitable for the species. So the changing climate conditions that we used in the simulation um, were a 120,000 year record of terrestrial climate change um, over the Pleistocene. So year zero here um, is 120,000 years ago. And then we're stepping forward into the present day every 100 years. And each point you see here is a particular point on earth with a specific temperature and precipitation condition. And you can see how those conditions shift and change through time. So these spatiotemporal dynamics of climate, the change across space and the change through time and climate could cause three different processes, rain shifts, speciation, local, well, four really, local extirpation and true extinction. And in our simulation, speciation occurred through range fragmentation as a result of climate change. So if uh, an area became unsuitable, uh, for a species, um, and if populations remained isolated for a sufficient period of time, then speciation would result. So speciation therefore occurred allopatrically as a result of geographic isolation. And isolation, as I mentioned, occurred because of climate change. Um, and sufficient isolation is obviously really difficult to define, but in our simulation framework, we uh, chose 10,000 years. So extinction uh, would occur if all of the occupied suitable habitat for a species disappeared, or if a species couldn't keep pace with uh, climate change based on their dispersal ability. Um, so this is illustrated here. So what we found uh, from the simulations is that we actually could replicate latitudinal diversity gradients um, using the simulation framework. I, don't, I think this is pretty exciting. Uh, I'm still excited about it, even though this work is a bit um, old now. Uh, because all we did was place some initial points on Earth, give our points a dispersal ability and a tolerance level, and then watch how those points or those virtual species responded to realistic estimates of how climate changed over the last 120,000 years. And from no starting diversity gradient and even diversity gradient, in fact, we could actually produce a diversity pattern that is remarkably similar to empirical diversity gradients like you see here for birds, mammals, and amphibians. And this diversity gradient emerged primarily due to higher rates of speciation at low latitudes. So the spatiotemporal dynamics of climate near the equator fragmented ranges more, um, which elevated rates of, of low latitude speciation. Um, and this is just like we saw in the empirical data for planktonic foraminifera in the marine realm, which I think is quite interesting. <laughs> 
And because this is a simulation framework, um, we could actually look at what was driving that low latitude speciation. So what was actually fragmenting species ranges? And what becomes clear is that precipitation is the driving force. So it's actually causing the range fragmentation, the isolation, and eventually that speciation due to its um, variability across space and through time. So an interesting question is, obviously this is only over the last 120,000 years. So can this mechanism be extended further back in time? And I think the answer is yes. Um, low latitude variability in precipitation was likely present throughout much of Earth history um, because atmospheric moisture is um, a strongly nonlinear function of temperature. So meaning any small variation in temperature is amplified by the moisture cycle. So as long as the tropics were warm, high variability in precipitation was likely uh, present at low latitudes. So I think, again, what's exciting is that we're able to replicate these empirical diversity patterns remarkably well. Um, and this is largely, largely structured by climate change, um, which causes higher rates of speciation. So the work I showed you um, on LDGs uh, in planktonic for foraminifera suggests that LDGs steepen in colder climates. Um, and this pattern has been shown in some previous studies in deep time that looked at snapshots with the general thought that warmer climatic intervals or periods have flatter biodiversity gradients. And so in work that's ongoing right now in my lab, we're testing whether this pattern um, is seen not only in planktonic foraminifera, but also in marine invertebrates more broadly across the Phanerozoic. And to do so, uh, we first need to think about how we standardize for area in sampling, um, just like I had to do when constructing latitudinal diversity gradients for planktonic foraminifera. Except for planktonic foraminifera, it's a heck of a lot more easy to do so because we have such a good fossil record. And it's much more difficult when you're dealing uh, with Phanerozoic scale marine invertebrate data. Um, and when we're thinking about fossil data, um, standardization is necessary because of the species area effect, uh, which you're all very familiar with. So the more area that is sampled, the more diversity that can be found. And because of this, global diversity curves reflect not only species richness, but also the area and extent of observation, which is really problematic when you're dealing with a fossil record and how that fossil record can vary in spatial extent over time. So when we um, control or account for spatial biases, we often actually change our understanding of large scale diversity patterns over geological time scales. And you can actually see that here, this is just um, a, global rich, a global quotation marks richness curve. Um, and when we actually use spatially standardized approaches, um, we get uh, a much flatter diversity gradient over the Phanerozoic. So to construct um, LDGs uh, for marine invertebrates over these really long time scales, um, we are controlling for variation in the size and sampling intensity of regions using equal area hexagonal and pentagonal grid cells like you see here. And we're testing a variety of different sizes of those grid cells, which you can see here. Um, we had to have the grid cells uh, meet certain quality criteria. So uh, they had to have sufficient sampling and sufficient numbers of fossils to be included in the analysis. And using these grid cells, we can then um, actually uh, do further sub uh, sampling uh, standardization. So apply rarefaction or what we call SQS in, in paleontology to account for even more um, issues of sampling biases. The data that we were, are using for these studies um, come from the paleobiology database, um, and we used over 690,000 occurrences in about 28,000-ish uh, genera. So we can then plot these regional richness estimates from those grid cells that I showed you, divided into latitudinal zones, um, and construct latitudinal diversity gradients. What I'm showing you here are diversity gradients through time um, with a bin temporal binning scheme of roughly 11 million years. So this is a much coarser temporal uh, scale than in the planktonic foraminiferal study. I realize that there's a lot of plots here and you might not be able to see the details, but what's important are the overall patterns. And what you notice, um, hopefully, is that some of these bins are, have no data. 
And that's because I actually blanked out all of the time bins that aren't sufficient for estimating diversity gradients, which means there are fewer than four richness estimates in each paleolatitudinal zone. So the low, mid, and high latitudes. Um, so a lot of our time bins, unfortunately, don't meet uh, this quality criteria, meaning that it's really difficult to actually quantify a diversity gradient in deep time. But if we take a step back um, and we look at those time periods that we do feel a bit more confident in, um, you can see a general trend of decreasing diversity towards um, high latitudes, but there is variation in this pattern and a lot of the uh, patterns aren't statistically significant. Because spatial uh, coverage is so patchy over the Phanerozoic, um, which was shown by those blanked out time bins, uh, we can potentially gain a better understanding of broad scale diversity patterns by pooling data into longer temporal intervals. I think, you know, there's a, a lot of questionable things about this, um, this approach, but if we do, uh, then we do get sort of this general pattern again of declining diversity from the equator to the poles. Uh, at least for the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic, and the patterns are now uh, statistically significant. But um, even with all of this spatial standardization and thinking about controlling for sampling through time, there's still a fundamental problem with estimating latitudinal diversity gradients, which is that ver this variation in spatial coverage through time, which I'm showing you here. So paleo latitude is here, time is on the x-axis going towards the present day on the right. Um, and uh, the reds are um, grid cells or, or regions um, and time combinations that have fossils, sufficient fossils. And then the blue is actually the shallow marine area that we would ex that we expect based on our understanding of continental configuration at the time. And what you can hopefully see from this is that not all time periods have good latitudinal coverage. Um, and um, some our spatial sampling is quite heavily concentrated in paleo temperate latitudes for a lot of time periods. And this is quite problematic if we're wanting to actually construct diversity gradients um, over the Phanerozoic. Hopefully you also can notice um, this trend here where our sampling um, and, and where we have the most intense sampling increases in latitude towards the Northern Hemisphere over time. And this trend is concerning um, because what we think it shows is that the paleo latitudinal peak in diversity tracks higher sampling that's present in Europe and North America through time. So peak uh, diversity is equatorially centered when Europe and North America are on the equator and peak diversity is at temperate latitudes when Europe and North America sit at temperate latitudes. And this is of course because through time, the continents have moved from basically where Antarctica is today um, and have slowly shifted northward through time. And you can actually see this shift through time uh, in this plot of sampling through time because North America and Europe are so heavily sampled. So um, this is also shown really well, I think here as well, where the median paleo latitude of North America is in blue, the median paleo latitude of Europe is in pink through time, and then the richest 10 degree latitudinal band is in green, and all correspond uh, remarkably closely. So I think this pattern has implications for how we interpret and understand LDGs in deep time, because it's often said that during very warm intervals of time, like the Mesozoic, um, peak diversity shifts from the equator to mid latitudes because the tropics get too hot to support species. The tropics are vacated in a sense. But this mid latitude peak in diversity during warm intervals may simply reflect the fact that North America and Europe are sitting at that latitude at that time, and in fact, not reflect uh, climate dynamics at all. And so I think this is something that we need to think about how to deal with this overwhelming um, bias, sampling bias um, and, uh, in a bit more detail. But um, one crude way to, to deal with it is to simply exclude North America and Europe and re-examine the diversity patterns through time. Um, and this is what I'm showing you here on the bottom panel. It's pretty heavy handed to do this, but we can see stronger evidence for a modern style latitudinal diversity gradient through various points in the Phanerozoic, so over the last 540 or so million years. 
And um, focusing on areas outside of North American Europe also seems to produce a clear difference in diversity gradients between hot and cold intervals of the Phanerozoic, um, which we define based on uh, Scotese's 2021 Earth Sciences Review paper. So maybe actually there is evidence that um, there's a steeper gradient during colder intervals of the Phanerozoic and then a shallower gradient during warmer intervals, um, which would be consistent with the results that we obtained for planktonic foraminifera when focusing only on the last 40 million years. So uh, with that, um, to, to conclude, uh, I, I hope that, um, you know, I have provided at least some evidence of that steeper gradients may occur during cold intervals of time, which has been shown uh, by work in the past. Higher equatorial diversity, uh, at least in the, in the work I've done so far, may be driven by low latitude speciation. And this might be due to spatiotemporal heterogeneity um, in environments. So either in climate like precipitation on land or in temperature variability within the water column, if we're thinking about the sea for planktonic foraminifera. Um, and I think we really need to think more about how we standardize for space and sampling uh, when, we're, when we're constructing these diversity gradients and query whether we can build diversity gradients in some time intervals um, due to the data that we have. So with that, uh, Thanks so much again for, for tuning in um, and for inviting me to speak. Thanks to all of these funding agencies. And then especially thanks to all of the people who helped uh, with my research and the collaborators here. So yeah. Many thanks Erin for the wonderful discussion. It was really very interesting presentation and it was really clear. So um, let's get started to with the Q&A session. So attendees can type their questions in the Q&A space or raise a hand to ask it along, as Sandra mentioned at the beginning. Yes, 